Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we have um, the great opportunity. We have Home Guard um, here with us, and they're going to talk about termite inspection training, everything you need to know to make sure that you and your clients are ready, how to read the reports, make sure you have somebody qualified like Home Guard coming in um, and getting those uh, reports to you. I'm going to introduce um, Jim, and he's going to take it over and um, introduce his team. So Jim, um, welcome and thank you uh, everyone for being here. Well, thanks for having us. We appreciate the opportunity. Um, we are gonna be doing a termite inspection training today. So we're gonna talk um, about the process of an inspection, what's included on those inspections, um, uh, how to convey the information that you're reading in the reports to your clients uh, to better educate yourselves so that you um, can, can assist your clients a little bit more. So before we start, uh, I'm going to kick it over to Marlin. She's going to do a little commercial, talk to you guys uh, about some of the things that Home Guard's able to offer, and then we'll jump into to the actual uh, nitty gritty of the, the termite training. So uh, take it away, Marlin. Thanks, Jimmy. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to our uh, webinar today. So real fast, at Home Guard, when you call, you get to order your termite, your property, your roof inspection, your natural hazard, and your home warranty. And the more you order, the more you save. In fact, when you order the termite and their property inspection, you get the roof inspection for free. When you call and you get an 8.30 or a 10.30 appointment, you're gonna receive your reports on the same day. And if you get the afternoon appointments, go ahead and tell customer service that it's a rush and you will still receive your reports the next day by 7 p.m. We also have Saturday appointments available and we have no extra charge for that. Ashley follow-up. Thanks, Marlin. Uh, thank you all for having us here. Um, as Marlin said, the more you order, the more you save. You can also build escrow with our company, um, and you can also get a um, discount if you pay at the time of an inspection. Um, also, with all of our inspectors, at the end of an inspection, if you have any questions, they will be able to go over that via their iPad. That way, if there's any sort of questions, you have the inspector right there to ask those sort of questions. So without further ado, Jimmy, take it away. Okay, so here we go. That was the commercial. We got that out of the way. Let's talk about the termite inspection report. Um, I know this is webinar style broadcast, so if you guys have um, questions, Ashley's going to be handling the chat. I think that's probably the easiest way. Send your question over there. She uh, has no problem interrupting me. She's been doing it for her entire life. So uh, we'll get into it. We'll get started on the termite inspection training. Um, I'm going to be sharing this uh, PowerPoint and then I will make these slides available. I will send these over to Jody, and then she can uh, distribute the PowerPoint that we have here. So uh, let's get into it. Um, this is what we're going to be talking about today. There's a couple different kind of categories that we're going to go over. Uh, a couple different things that make this report, this termite report, unique from any other inspection that you guys are, are ordering. Uh, one of the things is termite uh, inspectors are required to be licensed. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about what to expect on your inspection. What what you're going to see when you have the termite guy out there. I know COVID is a little bit interesting right now, but if you're there at the inspection, what you're going to watch the termite inspector do, uh, how to read the report. You guys want to be educated on, on reading the report so that when your clients have questions, they can ask you those and you guys can answer the questions for them. Obviously, the inspection companies that you guys are choosing uh, will answer those questions for you and you always have that resource, but the more you know, the better you're going to seem, the more business you're going to do. Um, different types of the inspections on a termite report. We're going to talk about uh, complete inspections, limited inspections, uh, supplemental inspections, re-inspections, the different findings we have, the terms that we use, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, at the end about the different certifications that are required uh, on certain transactions, what lenders are looking for, um, what you guys can look for on, on some of the different properties that we have. So let's get into it. This is what every single termite report looks like in California. I'll give you a little uh, uh, background on myself. Uh, I am a third generation termite inspector. My grandfather uh, owned an inspection company, started in the 60s. Uh, my, my father branched off from my grandfather's company in the late 80s and started Home Guard with his business partner. Uh, I graduated college twice to never work in the family business. Ta-da, here I am. But when my grandfather had his company and when we first started Home Guard, this is what the report looked like because this is a state mandated form that we must use. Um, so every single termite report that you get, no matter which company you're choosing, 
will look like this slide here. This is kind of the, the cover image for a termite inspection report. So what we're going to do is kind of go over the different sections of this report so that you guys can understand what it is that you're looking for, what the different checkboxes mean, um, and then how to uh, read and understand this report because all of the reports are the same. So I've already referred to this report four or five times as a termite inspection. Um, and I think in a lot of the contracts, it's actually referred to as a pest inspection, but both of those are a little bit misleading. At the top, you can see what this report is actually called. In this red box at the top, this report from the state of California is called a wood destroying pest and organisms inspection report. Um, we call it a termite report on our end. A lot of agents call it a pest report, but both of those are misleading because they don't fully, we look for more than just termites, but we also don't identify general pests. So what we identify um, is a wood destroying pest and a wood destroying organism. The pest is generally termites. Uh, there are a couple different types of beetles that cause damage in California. There's a, a carpenter ant that causes wood damage. Uh, and then the wood destroying organism is fungus, fungus damage to wood, which is essentially water damage to wood. So we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about wood destroying pests and wood destroying organisms. In California, you have to have a license to identify wood destroying pests and organisms. Um, it's one of the few inspections that you have where the inspector comes out and he is individual, he or she is individually licensed. Um, I have a termite inspection license. Uh, I can go out and perform a termite inspection, but but if you don't have that license, you can't perform the inspection. And that's separate, a home inspection, a roof inspection, a chimney, a pool inspection, all of those inspectors come out and none of them have to be licensed. But the termite report, the termite inspector does. It's a wood destroying pest and organisms inspection report and it's governed by the Structural Pest Control Board. Uh, my grandfather was actually president of the Structural Pest Control Board uh, in the late 80s. Um, so this report up at the top, if you're new, if you're in this class and, and you're taking this uh, webinar to, to educate yourself on an inspection report and you're new to the industry, don't call it a wood destroying pest and organisms inspection report because every agent's gonna know that you're brand new right there. Call it a termite report, call it a pest report, but let's talk about what it is that we're actually gonna look at and we'll get into that in just a few minutes there. The next box on this form is, seems very mundane, seems like not a whole lot of useful information is there, but it's very important. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that the address is correct on this report. Uh, if you're turning these reports into lenders and there's a problem and it comes up at the last second that maybe we had a number wrong or the street versus an avenue, those things will hold up a transaction at the very end when you're, you know, you're up against these tight deadlines. You wanna make sure that the address is correct. Uh, here you can see the date of the inspection. I was talking with Jody earlier about how good is a report good for? How long is a report good for? Um, generally speaking, reports, um, are good for as long as the condition was there. In California, we go through seasons. We, we have changes in, in climate and, and moisture conditions. On average, a report is good for about four months. Conditions change every four months. So if you're looking at an inspection report from an agent who sent you over, uh, you know, you're, you represent the buyer and the, the seller sends you a, uh, an inspection report, but it's, you know, eight, nine, 10 months, it's a year and a half old, you might wanna have an updated report done because it's likely that conditions have changed uh, at that property. However, a, a termite inspection report is, is good for as long as the condition was present. If I go out and do an inspection and I don't identify something now that causes harm later, and they can be proven that that was evident at the time of my inspection, the inspection company is responsible for that. So keep that in mind. And then the total number of pages. You know, on this report, we have 15 pages here. If, if you receive a copy from another agent and there's only you know, six of the 15 pages, what's going on on those other nine pages? You're gonna to wanna to know. So looking at that gives you an idea of what, what this report is all about. Uh, property information here, uh, Ashley and, and Marlin touched on the fact that we allow you to build to escrow. We need to have that escrow information though if, if that's what you're gonna want. So um, when you call in your, your inspections to whatever company you're choosing, uh, make sure that you give them the property information, who owns the property, um, who the inspections are being ordered by, and then if there is escrow information, make sure you include that in your order. So here's, here's where we're gonna start talking about the report itself and the different types of inspections. When we go out and we perform inspections, there are different checkboxes that we have to identify for the Structural Pest Control Board. Is this a complete report? Is this a limited report, a supplemental report or a re-inspection? 
And we're going to talk about each one of those. Pretty simply put, a complete report is just that. It's a complete inspection of the entire property. Uh, anything attached, decks, patios, inside and outside. On average, your single family home most likely will be a complete report. And we talk about what a complete report is here. A complete report is an inspection of the entire structure and all attached or abutted structures. Abutted means anything that comes in contact with that. This report is commonly used when inspecting detached homes. So again, your single family homes are going to be complete reports, but we don't always sell or buy single family homes. Sometimes we have condos, sometimes we have duet homes. Um, so we would, if we get to that property, we would mark a limited report. And a limited report is used uh, when we only inspect certain areas or certain portions of the home, uh, a condo where we're only inspecting the inside, or maybe we're inspecting the inside and just the uh, exclusive use areas on the outside, maybe the patio, but we're not gonna inspect things that aren't owned uh, by the owner. Sometimes there's an HOA involved. So if we're excluding a portion of a structure or a portion of a, a home, then we must make that a limited report. If there's a deck attached to the home and you don't want that deck inspected, we would say, okay, this is a limited report and we're going to exclude the deck. And we put that on the, pad, uh, on the inspection report. So if you or, or take a, a listing and this, order your inspection, call customer service, they're gonna say, hey, what's going on? What's at this property? They're gonna ask you all the questions. If you want everything inspected, it's a complete report. If there are certain portions of the home that we aren't inspecting, it's a limited report. We will mark this box limited, and then in the next box down, we would uh, say what it is that we're excluding. The next type of report that we have is a supplemental report, and we use a supplemental report like an addendum in your contract. So um, if we go out to a property and there's a certain area that we can't inspect, most commonly a, a garage full of storage or a, a locked bedroom, and we have to come out at a later time, we have to issue that separate report on a, on a supplemental. And it, and it just is like an addendum in your contract, it just is an additional report that gets added to the original inspection. But there's another time that we use a supplemental report and that would be um, if work is being performed at the property or we're opening up areas and we find additional damage, we have to note that. In the state of California, I have a license and I must identify any condition that I see that's wood destroying. So I, if I get out to a property and uh, there's a water stain on the ceiling and we call to have that open, that's gonna be a supplemental report. And we're gonna issue that supplemental report saying we opened this area and here's what we found. If we don't find anything, we say that. But let's say I open up that water stain ceiling and I see some wood damage or an active leak. I have to identify those conditions and those conditions would be identified in a supplemental report. And then finally, we have a reinspection report. And a reinspection report is uh, when a termite inspection company goes out, let's say you have Home Guard go out, and we identify 10 conditions at the property, and we give a dollar amount to repair those. It's so one of the things that separates a termite inspection from a home inspection. A termite inspection is licensed so we can do the repairs. There, are, there is no licensing requirement in, in California for a home inspector. Any home inspector that you have come out to your property, uh, there's no license, but because of that, the California Business and Professions Code says that no work can be performed off of a home inspection. So termite inspection, I go out, I'm licensed, our company has a general contractor's license, we give you a, a bid to repair the work, but you don't want to use us to do the work. Maybe your uh, family member is a contractor and they can do the repairs. Great. But I still have to go back out as the original inspector if you want us to certify that property, if you want us to say that the conditions have been removed, I, as the original inspector, must go out there, or the original inspection company must go out there and certify that all of the damage has been removed from the property. I'm not gonna say that uh, uh, everything's been put back in a, in a similar manner, or that I'm not gonna make any sort of comments on the craftsmanship, but I will identify if the damage or infestation has been removed from the property. And that would show up on a reinspection report. So um, I talked about when I'm, making a limited report. In the general description, I would note that. Um, the general description is important to read. Uh, a lot of agents, that's not even something that they look at, but it's been known to happen, especially with company, home guard 50,000 inspections in a year. There have been times where neighbors have been selling houses at the same time and an inspector starts the property on the wrong house 
or turns in a report, the general description needs to align with what the condition, what the property description is. So if you're looking at a general description here of a one story single family wood framed residence with brick stucco and wood exterior, but you have a two story with uh, no, no brick, something's off there. And you're gonna wanna let us know that because that will cause a problem later. And it's something that easily can be fixed. So you just wanna make sure that you're, you're looking when you're reading the general description, that it is on the description of the property that you guys are looking at. Uh, an inspection tag posted. So in California, every time I do a termite inspection, I must post a tag. And you guys have seen them. They're the little three by five cards. A lot of times you're gonna find them in the garage, um, attic and sub area. Not a lot of us uh, outside of the inspectors go into the sub area, but anytime we post, anytime we do an inspection or uh, complete some sort of work, chemical work, we're gonna post those tags. Um, and, and we'll note uh, where we posted our tag, as well as other tags that we identified. Um, so if I'm crawling in the sub area and I see that there was another inspection company out there six months ago, I'm going to write that and, and it'll show up in that box there, other tags posted. It gives interested parties an idea of what type of inspections have been happening in a, in a shorter period, short amount of time. So let's get into, you know, what we talked about this being a wood destroying pest and organisms inspection report. Uh, what are those wood destroying pests and organisms? Obviously, termites uh, are the biggest conditions here in the valley. Uh, you know, I'm in San Jose right now. I think most of us are, are in, you know, Santa Clara County or close to it. A lot of termite activity. We have to understand that termites' main function in life is to take a dead piece of wood, break it down, and return it to the soil. And this this whole area used to be orchards, and so we we have an abundance. Plus, you know, we're close enough to the ocean where we have this nice, soft, uh, fertile soil. This area is infested with termites. Um, it's, you know, it's been a good business for our family, but it's, this, this area has a lot of termites because they don't understand the difference between a dead tree branch and your home because they're, they're, they're built out of the same thing. So um, we have two main types of termites. Uh, a third type of termite we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, we have a condition called fungus, which is essentially synonymous with, with dry rot. We'll talk a little bit about the, the misnomer there, but fungus and dry rot conditions. We also identify other findings. These will be conditions that would likely lead to either termites or fungus. And then we have further inspections and we'll talk about all of those uh, in detail here moving forward. Uh, the first box that we have, subterranean termites. I'll read this to you and then we'll talk a little bit about what subterranean termites are. Uh, these are types of termites that are ground dwelling. Subterranean termites access the wood via mud shelter tubes. The most common treatment of this type of termite is a chemical treatment of the infested soil. So I go out and I perform an inspection and I'm crawling underneath your house. What I'm looking for for subterranean termites are these little mud tubes and they're their shelter tubes. It's a way that subterranean termites, if you break the word down, sub, below, terranean, the earth, subterranean live in the ground. It's a way for them to get from the ground safely to a piece of wood. A piece of wood, what they're, you know, thousands, millions of years, what the piece of wood is just a branch or a tree that has fallen in a forest. Termites are gonna take that piece of wood and, and break it down. Subterranean termites grab that wood, they harvest it and they bring it back to their colony underground. But they need to be safe in getting to that piece of wood. So what I'm looking for are these little mud tubes about the size of a pencil or I'm holding a pen here for anybody looking. We'll look at some pictures here. Um, and they, they travel from the ground up these mud tubes to your home, generally underneath your home, your, their uh, mud sills and uh, sill plates, um, girders, posts, they eat that wood, they take that wood, they harvest it, and they bring it back to their colony where they, they share that wood. So looking at the subterranean termites, this is what I'm looking for. Now these are obviously uh, very um, large infestations. It's rare that I see anything like this. You know, I might see this first top left picture here would be something that I would see. And what you can see there are these tubes that are coming up from the ground. The, if you can imagine this being a post underneath your house, and this is probably a four by six or four by eight girder. They're working up the foundation wall. They get into that wood, and now they start harvesting this wood and building these tunnels back down to the ground. If it's a really large infestation, you're going to notice these things that kind of look like uh, coral underneath the house. I've seen this a few times um, in crawling some houses where I, I physically have to knock the tubes over. When you do that, it would probably be the only time that you would see the live 
termite like this. It's rare that as an inspector, I'm looking at live termites. Uh, maybe if there's a piece of wood in the sub area, uh, and if I flip that piece of wood over, I might find subterranean termites, live termites, and they look like this here. This is what I'm gonna see as they're harvesting the wood. And then they take it back, and what they do is they take it back to their colony to feed the colony. And there's a different, you know, subterranean termites are a lot like ants. All termites are like ants in that they have uh, cats. They have a system in which uh, there's the queen, and she's the main reproductive. There's a class of termites that mate with the queen called reproductives. There's a class of termites called the soldiers that obviously protect. And then there's the workers, and they go out and they harvest the wood and they bring it back to their soldiers and they bring it back to, to other workers, they bring it back to the queen. Um, and, and so the, I, we never see the queen, she's, she's in the colony, um, but they are large and they are, they are much, much larger than the subterranean termites. Termites are, are smaller than the ants. Um, what we have to look for is the evidence of those termites. And, and this is what it is that we're looking at. Um, I know these say, this, I'm just noticing this now, I'll change this for the next one. These say dry wood termite up here. Uh, these are subterranean termites. Um, and I'll fix that for the, the slides that I send out. But um, what we're looking for are these conditions. Uh, if I'm in a house and I'm looking for damage, I'm gonna see damage, subterranean termite damage that looks like this. Subterranean termites, as they, as they harvest the wood, as they eat, they're destroying the structural stability of the wood. Uh, subterranean termites are a little bit more damaging, not only because of the way that they eat, uh, they're more damaging than dry wood termites uh, in sheer size alone. Uh, their colonies are about 10 times the size of, of a uh, dry wood termite colony. So when we're looking at a property, uh, these are the conditions that I'm looking for. This is what helps me identify termites, subterranean termites, and then I'm going to call to treat those termites. And we talked about the most common uh, type of, um, let's see if I can go back one slide, the most common type of treatment for subterranean termites is going to be a chemical treatment. And that's where we drill a series of holes around the property. Um, and you guys have seen these holes are about every 12, 16 inches apart. Um, holes, five eighths inch diameter hole that will drill it through concrete. Um, if there's concrete around the property, if there's dirt, we're gonna take this long rod, shove it down into the soil and apply the chemical. The chemical that we use is a, is a transfer chemical in that I don't have to, to get the, the chemical onto every single termite to wipe the colony out. There's really only one termite that I need to, to kill and that's the queen because she's the main reproductive, reproductive termite. So if, if I can get the chemical to the queen, then I can wipe the colony out. Well, how do we get it to them? We apply enough chemical around those areas that we're seeing the termites so that that chemical gets on to the termites and then they transfer that chemical. Um, they're like ants in that they groom each other. And they also leave a pheromone trail to let the other termites know where the food is at. Uh, when they cross each other, they're passing that chemical without knowing it. They, they, don't, they can't sense it, taste it, feel it, smell it. So they get, in this, they get in contact with this chemical and then over time that chemical will kill the termites. There are other types of treatments um, and HomeGuard has these other types of treatments, most commonly orange oil that is a contact chemical. It has to come in contact with the termite to kill the, the termite colonies. And they're effective treatments, um, but they don't transfer. And so a little bit more of the chemical has to be used in a little bit broader of an area. If I can find an access point where subterranean termites are coming from the soil to the wood, I can apply chemical directly to the soil and let that chemical get on a few termites. And then as they groom each other, and as they take that food back, and as the, they interact with the soldiers and interact with reproductives, that reproductive is gonna take that chemical and take it to the queen and then it wipes the queen out and it wipes the colony out. Uh, and that's a liquid chemical that we inject into the soil, uh, a couple different styles of treatment. One, we can do a local treatment, which would be right at the spot that we're seeing the subterranean termite tubes. If I get to a property and I only find one area with tubes, I'm gonna call a local spot treatment for the subterranean termites. But if I get there and they're all around the sub area and they're also outside working up the foundation walls and maybe I notice them working up the cold joint in the garage, I'm gonna call to have the entire house treated where we drill around the entire structure and then drill around where we're noticing them, either in the soil, uh, complete soil treatment underneath the home, um, in the garage, we're gonna work around the interior and exterior, the, the foundation, and apply that chemical. So that's the subterranean termite. The other type of termite that we most commonly know is a dry wood termite, and their name is what they eat. Dry wood termites 
not only eat dry wood, but that's also where they live. So let's read this. Dry wood termites build their colonies inside the wood that they are infesting. Unlike subterraneans, dry woods do not have to maintain contact with the soil to get moisture. There are several recognized methods of treatment for dry wood termites, such as fumigation and localized chemical treatments. So for subterranean termites, I'm looking for those mud tubes. That's the, the number one indicator for, for subterranean termites. For dry wood termites, I'm looking for something else, and they're called pellets. Um, I, I graduated college two different times, and I identify termite poop all day, because that's what termite pellets are. Uh, the termite will, dry wood termite will eat the wood. They live in the wood. Um, they eat the wood on site. And a microorganism inside of its stomach uh, will take that piece of wood, that cellulose, and strip all of the, the sugar out of it. They, they turn the cellulose into glucose, and that is what a termite will survive on. Once they've excreted all, or once they've, they've extracted all of the nutrients from that piece of wood, they excrete that piece of wood. And these are what we find, these dry wood termite pellets. Now this is very indicative of a condition I would find underneath the home or, or on this picture here, on some rafter tails coming down. Um, this is what I'm looking for. And these are these little pellets. They look like little granules of sand. You can kind of see what dry wood termite swarmers look like here. Uh, and then what their termite pellets are in comparison to a penny. There are some times where I will only find two or three dry wood termite pellets. In comparison to a penny there, that's a pretty small uh, area. And that's part of my license, part of my expertise is being able to identify those conditions. Agents are, you know, you guys do your, your agent visual inspection disclosure. You guys aren't trained to look for this stuff. And that's the purpose of ordering your inspections. In this case, ordering a termite inspection, you can offset the liability that you would normally take on and give it to a professional company to go out there. Let us be the ones to find those conditions. You guys aren't trained, you're not licensed to do this. Uh, so that's why you're gonna order the inspections and let us as the professional, the termite inspection companies, and there are a lot of great termite inspection companies in, in this area be, because there are a ton of termites, um, but this is dry wood termite pellets. Um, sometimes I find conditions like this uh, where I'll find a nice cluster of dry wood termite pellets. Uh, sometimes it's one or two, three on a windowsill. Uh, and then what I have to do is be able to determine if that infestation is able to be treated locally or if that infestation has to be treated on a larger scale. So um, if I go out to a property and I find one spot with dry wood termites, maybe I'm at a windowsill um, and I find dry wood termite pellets on the windowsill, I look up and I see in the sheetrock that there are these little punch out, what we call kick out holes. It's where a dry wood termite will eat to the surface because they're living inside of the areas that they're also excreting this wood, they need to kick out those pellets so that they can continue to, to uh, uh, live inside of the wood. Well, if, if I can determine where those kick out holes are, and it's maybe one or two spots inside of a home, we can do a local treatment where we take that uh, area and we drill into the wood. The same chemical that we apply into the soil for the subterranean termites, we're gonna apply to the soil, I mean, we're gonna apply to the wood uh, and treat the, the wood members of the home with the same chemical. Same concept applies where we can get some in where we know that the termites are at. We know where dry wood termites live because we see their pellets. It's hard for us to determine where subterranean termites live. We know where they access the wood, but we don't know where their colonies are at. And that's why a lot of times we're doing a treatment all the way around the property. Dry wood termites, if I see pellets and I see a kick out hole, that's where the termites are. They live there, they live in the wood. So I can take that chemical, apply it to the wood and uh, treat the wood. But sometimes I get to a property and I find dry wood termites uh, outside in some rafters underneath the house here on, on the, the mud sill where the rim joist meets the mud sill. Sometimes I'll find them in the garage. If I find them in three, four or five different locations, local treatments aren't gonna work. A lot of times those aren't even the same infestation. You might have two different colonies there, two different queens, two different reproductive. So what we have to do is gas the entire property. And that's where we put the tarp on the house, the house goes camping for the weekend, and we inject chemical gas into the home. It's, it's essentially the same chemical as the, the liquid form, but it's just in gas form. We seal the home and we pump that gas into the home. And that's called a fumigation. And you guys have seen that for any new agent in here without even knowing it, you know what a fumigation is. It is a little bit more, not a little bit, it's a lot of bit more than a uh, local treatment, invasive. Um, 
it's also a little bit more of a, a hassle to deal with the fumigation. So what you want to make sure is choosing when, it, when you guys are looking at all the different companies, choose a company that can offer you some local treatments because local treatment sometimes is a better option. Sometimes it works better in a real estate transaction to do a, a local treatment. If, if the house is vacant and you can time the fumigation when the seller moves out before the buyer moves in, obviously you would do a fumigation at that point, but sometimes we're under some, some strict timelines, um, different conditions, uh, finances have, to have a play in this. Uh, fumigation isn't always the best option. You might want to have a local treatment done if it can be done. Uh, the inspector will make the determination if a local treatment will work. We inject the chemical directly into the soil. If not, we would do a fumigation. Um, you guys see the, the difference here. We have some, some workers and some soldiers. You can tell a soldier by these big mandibles, these big jaws that use to protect themselves uh, and their colony. And these are the swarmers. Termites swarm generally twice a year, in the spring and in the fall, under certain weather conditions. Uh, generally speaking, you know, on a sunny day, a warm day after a rain, termites will, will swarm. And all termites fly, subterranean termites, drywood termites, they all fly, but they don't really know how to fly. They're not born with the wings. Uh, the wings are, are too big for their body technically, so they don't really have a, a flight pattern. Uh, they kind of just get caught in the wind currents. Um, and what, what that is, is the colony, it's when a subter or subterranean or drywood termite grows wings, it's their sign that their colony is full and they need to go start a new colony. And a male and a female, if they land together, they'll drop their wings and then they'll start a new colony. And the, the female becomes the queen of that colony. And I've been at properties where out of the siding on an exterior, uh, on, on a home, the exterior siding, there'll be a, a hole there, and I'm watching subterranean termites just come out of there one by one, plop, 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 plop. They land, they get caught in the wind currents, they move around, and what they're looking for is a new piece of wood. Uh, oftentimes, that new piece of wood is a home. So uh, spring and in the fall is when you'll start to notice those uh, uh, dry wood swarmers, subterranean swarmers. When I find swarmers in a home, drywood termites, particularly in an attic, it's hard to determine where they came from because I, I can't see a kick out hole where they're at. Uh, I also wouldn't see any pellets by where they're at. So a lot of times if swarmers are the only termites that I find for drywood termites, you're going to see um, a fumigation call. And you might ask the inspector, well, you only found termites in one area. Why can't you do a local treatment? It would be because it's hard to determine where they're at. I do need to know where the drywood termites are at in order to kill them with a local treatment. If not, then I have to do an all-encompassing uh, fumigation. Um, so keep that in mind when you guys are looking at, at your reports. Uh, the other condition that we're identifying here is fungus or dry rot. We'll read this together. Fungus, for the purpose of structural pest control, involves only wood decaying fungus. So I'm, when I go out there, there are lots of different types of fungus. Um, but what I'm looking for is the fungus that grows on wood that destroys the, the structural stability of that wood. Uh, wood that's been damaged by fungus must be removed and the excessive moisture condition which caused the fungus must be corrected. So I go out to a property and I notice that on your rafter tails, maybe when the contractor installed them or some repairs were done, um, they were installed and then the rafter tails were cut. And maybe they were never primed or painted. And so that, that cut end allows moisture intrusion. So if I'm out on the property and, I, and we have some pictures you'll see coming up and I identify some fungus damage, I have to identify that the piece of wood is damaged. I have to make a call as to what caused that damage. And then I have to make a call as to what it's going to take to remove that damage. With a lot of termite damage, we can treat the termites, essentially kill the termites and structurally support the wood. Because once we've handled the termite treatment, we don't have to worry about the termites causing more damage in that area. So we can add a piece of wood to that area and make that piece of wood stable and be done with it. Well, fungus conditions, I can't do that. I have to remove the fungus most times. There are some occasions where, where you can support it, but on, on average, when you guys are ordering your inspections and a, a termite inspector comes out and he identifies some fungus damage to a rafter or maybe underneath a the bathroom, there's some water damage because of tub or toilet leak, they're gonna make a call to remove that damage because I can't just add a new piece of wood there, that fungus will continue to spread to the new piece of wood. If I can completely eliminate the moisture condition, we might be able to structurally support that wood. But if you guys are noticing in your reports, just be prepared. If there's fungus conditions called in the report, 
is likely that we're going to call to remove that damage. Uh, dry rot is frequently misused as a common term for fungus. Dry rot is actually a result of long-term infection by wood decaying fungus. So dry rot actually happens uh, and, and there's, it was where the, the wood was wet and then maybe the, the moisture conditions stopped, but you still have that fungus. So it, it was caused by moisture. So dry rot's a little bit misleading, uh, but in, in most termite inspection reports, you guys are gonna see fungus and dry rot used synonymously. So, um, and these are you know, just some types of, of rot that we have. Um, some conditions were not like white rot. You can see the picture of the white rot here. White rot grows on live wood. We're not looking, when we look in an inspection, we're not looking at any live wood. All of it has been cut down, milled, dried, and used to install and, and construct your homes. We're not gonna find that type of wood on your home. What we are gonna find is where water gets on wood, dries out, gets wet, dries out, gets wet. Over time, the cell walls of that piece of wood are compromised and the structural stability is compromised. And so we call to have that piece of wood removed and replaced with a new piece of wood. And we also call to correct the moisture condition that caused it. And most of the times it's a water leak um, at a kitchen sink faucet or a kitchen sink drain. It leaks underneath and causes damage to the wood shelf underneath, uh, underneath bathrooms, a tub drain leak, a toilet drain leak. It's gonna cause wood to the subfloor. Uh, on the exterior, a lot of times it's just uh, moisture conditions in the air. Uh, South San Francisco, Daly City, Pacifica, a lot of areas where you have a lot of moisture in the air, just generally speaking, because of that fog bank there, there are conditions that are present, ever present. They're, they're always there. Every morning you have moisture conditions. So if there's a piece of wood that's damaged, we'll call the damaged wood, we'll say that it was damaged due to weather, and we'll call to replace that wood. Uh, it's a condition that people in those areas deal with. Santa Cruz Mountains, um, the Las Gatas, places where there's a, a tree canopy, and not a lot of sunlight gets in there, those areas are gonna have constant moisture conditions, constant fungus damage called, uh, and we would just get in there and call those. You'll see them report as either fungus or dry rot, but you'll have this slide to help you um, determine the difference. That brown rot, a lot of times we see that on like fences. Uh, it's kind of uh, pocket rot, um, rot that's in the wood, but we don't, ident we don't look at fences when we do our inspections. The inspections are limited to the structure itself. And the other finding that we're talking about here, so we've talked about the subterranean termites, the dry wood termites, the fungus and dry rot. Now we're talking about other findings. These are conditions that either have led to, to an infestation or infection or will lead to an infestation or infection. And, and in parentheses there, it's section two items. We're gonna talk about the different sections in every single termite report. Um, but the other conditions would be plumbing leaks, um, missing grout. And so we have some, some findings of that. Here you guys can see uh, some rain gutters full of water. That's a condition, rain gutters aren't supposed to hold water, they're supposed to collect the water and then drain the water. If you have that collection of water, eventually that water is going to leak and cause damage to some wood. It may not cause damage right now, but it will eventually. And so that's what we would consider a section two item. Uh, and we would identify that in our, our inspection. And then obviously this is a, an exaggerated picture, but it, we've all been at properties where we've seen conditions like this on this uh, tile and grout here, where the grout is missing in between the tile. And what that will allow is water to get in behind the tile. And then once that water is in behind the tile, it's gonna get onto the wood uh, two by four wall supports and cause damage to the, to the wood there. So if we get to a property and we identify conditions like this, we're gonna note that in our report. Uh, and then finally, a further inspection, and we talked a little bit about this. The most common further inspection we have is, is a, um, a garage full of storage. There are a lot of wonderful terms in real estate. Um, cozy translates to small. We've all, you know, written a, a property description. Cozy cottage. Well, when I read cozy cottage, I know that I'm about to inspect a small cottage. Light and bright is another wonderful term. But light and bright to me as an inspector just translates to the real estate agent telling the homeowner to take all of their stuff and move it out into the garage because we're going to do an open house or we're going to have the house staged. So take all your junk, box it up, move it in the garage. We want to make this house light and bright. And that's great, except I go out to a property and I open up the garage door and it's full of boxes, floor to ceiling. I can't do an inspection of that garage because I don't know if conditions are there or not. And I think we have some pictures. That's a pretty common picture. When I go out and do inspections, that's generally what I see in a garage maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but 
I can't do anything with that garage. I have to call that garage a further inspection because I don't know if there are termites or if there's fung fungus conditions present because of all of the storage. Somebody needs to come in and move that storage out and we'll return to further inspect that property. I would make a suggestion to, to choose a company that doesn't charge you to come back out on those types of further inspections uh, because they're very common. Uh, we understand that you know buying and selling a home is, is a difficult process. There's a lot of moving parts. Somebody might not have known to do that. We have some wonderful, wonderful videos on our website about how to prep your home for an inspection. But when we get to a property, we need to be able to look at the interior walls, the exterior walls, the garage walls, the attic and the sub area. So if you have a dresser over the, the sub area access, that stuff needs to be moved. Otherwise, it's gonna be a further inspection. Again, we don't charge to go back out and look at those, but it's a different day, different time. It's another time that somebody has to be present. During COVID, it's a nightmare anyways. So make sure that those conditions are, are handled prior to the inspector coming out. But again, I can't do anything with that garage other than note it as a further inspection. And then the other main further inspection that we find is a water stained ceiling or wall. In this other picture here, you can see this is probably underneath a bathroom upstairs, either a hall bath or master bath, where something has leaked. I don't know what's going in there. I, I'm not Superman. I can't see through that stain. So what I have to call is to have that stain open look in that area, make sure that first of all, nothing is actively leaking. Then I have to make sure that there's no damage. If, if I open that area, I call and make those conditions, I will issue those in a supplemental report as a further inspection item. Um, when you guys are ordering the reports, you wanna limit the further inspection items that you have. It will limit your liability, but it also limits the times that we have to go back out to that property. So we talked about the different types of reports. We talked about uh, complete, limited, uh, supplementals. We've talked about what it is that we're finding on those properties. Subterranean termites, ones that live in the ground, we treat those with chemical. Dry wood termites live in the wood. Uh, dry wood termites eat dry wood. Uh, uh, fungus or dry rot would be your water damaged wood members. Other findings would be conditions that eventually lead uh, to your infestations and infections and then further inspections would be anything that I wasn't able to determine at the time of my inspection. Any one of those five findings, subterranean, dry wood, there's a third type of termite called a damp wood termite. If dry wood eats dry wood, a damp wood would eat damp wood. Uh, we're gonna see those in those same high moisture areas, Pacifica, Daly City, Los Gatos, um, Santa Cruz Mountains. We're gonna find damp wood termites. Um, if you can eliminate the moisture condition, you can eliminate the damp wood termite. Uh, but other than that, they're, they're treated a lot like dry wood termites. Anytime we find subterranean termites, dry wood termites, fungus, dry rot, other findings or further inspections, they have to be issued in a certain way. The state makes your reports sectionalized reports. And there are only three sections in a, in a report. There are section one items, section two items, and further inspection or unknown items. So we'll talk about those. A section one item is anything active, termites or fungus. I think it is actual infestation or infection, infestation being termites, infection being fungus, caused by wood destroying pest or organisms, or the conditions that have led to infestations or infections. So if there is a leak and it isn't causing damage, I notify, uh, I see a leak, I note it in my report, but it hasn't caused any damage yet. It's not a section one. But if there's a leak and there is damage, both of them are section one items. The damage itself is a section one, fungus damage condition, and the leak, because it caused damage, now becomes a section one. Uh, if it hadn't caused any damage yet, it's a section two item. All conditions leading to section one, leaks that could have caused fungus, earthwood contacts, that could attract something, something that will eventually lead to a section one item is a section two item. And then a further inspection, again, what we talked about is um, anything that we don't know at the time of our inspection. So every single termite report will sectionalize their reports. They will tell you whether their finding is a section one finding, a section two finding, or a further inspection finding. That is going to be uh, uh, consistent across all termite inspection companies. Here's where things change a little bit on the way that they're identified in their report, the way that they're shown on a diagram. Every single termite inspection report, uh, a WDO, Wood Destroying Pest and Organism report, every single report has to have a diagram. And that's a, a, a complete inspection, limited inspection, uh, re-inspection, they all, supplementals, they all have to have a diagram. You're gonna see, you're gonna get to a property and you're gonna see your termite inspector and he's kind of marching and, and pacing things off. What he's doing is 
getting a general footprint of the home so that when he finds conditions, he can identify them on a diagram to help assist interested parties, real estate agents, you guys' clients, our customers. The way that they're identified on the reports differ from company to company. At HomeGuard, uh, our, our entire business model is real estate-based inspections. What we try to do is simplify the report. Section one items for us start with the section, uh, start with the number one. Section two items start with the number two, and then logically further inspection items would start with the number three. There are other companies, uh, my grandfather's company used to do this, but there are other companies that identify their conditions by location. So decks and patios might be start with the number four, driveway termites would start with the number two, subterranean termites would start with the number one, garages would start with the number eight, um, attic and sub areas start with the number 10. Either way, no matter how it's identified on a diagram, in the report itself, every single item must tell you whether it's a section one, section two, or a further inspection item. We'll talk a little bit about that moving forward. But you will see this diagram, it's, it's not to scale. I've had people call and say, hey, my deck looks small on this diagram. It's a big deck, I just have... It's, the inspector is doing the best he can to get a general overview, a general footprint of the home. And all that he's doing is just marking where the conditions were present so that you can look at this, you can read about section one item, 1A, fungus damage to some rafters, and then you can go back out to the diagram page and look and see, hey, okay, uh, there's one section 1A item, it's at the back of the property, you could then walk to the back of the property and identify that. HomeGuard takes it a, a little step further and we will include a picture of that. Uh, most termite inspection companies don't have that, but the diagram will serve as the purpose there. You guys can look at the diagram, read the item, and then identify where that damage is at so that it can be repaired. Here's an, this is on the, the third page of a termite inspection report. Uh, it's an areas not inspected, please read. It's in bold letters, it's in all caps. These are areas that no termite inspection company looks at. Um, interior of finished walls, we will not at our inspection open up your walls to look at what's going on inside. Um, we cannot make any, our, our inspection is a visual inspection. Uh, we, we can't do any sort of, uh, uh, there's a word for it I'm blanking on, but we can't do any sort of work to the property without having a signed authorization to do so. And the inspection is not a signed authorization to start commencing work on a property. Uh, so we're not looking inside of finished walls. We're not uh, looking inside of installed cabinets, um, some other underneath floor coverings. I'm not going to pull up the carpet in a room just because. Now I might be at a slider. Um, I'm looking at a, a door here. I might be at a slider and I feel that the wood is soft in the corner and I touch the wood with my, my finger and I can feel that the wood is damaged there. If I can get that wood up or that carpet up off of the tack strip, I might look underneath there. But we're not generally pulling up carpet to look at those areas. Sleeper floors, those are small areas that are constructed in, in, during the construction of your home. Sometimes they, they build up a sleeper floor to run ducting underneath. We're not looking inside of the sleeper floor. We're not opening that area up at the time of our inspection. And what this area is not inspected, please read page is, is designed so that you guys can read in this area to, to see what on that property is. This is not boilerplate. This isn't just on every single, it's the same paragraph on every single one. This is going to be particular to the home that we inspected. If I go to a house and it's all hardwood flooring and tile, and there's no carpet, I would never put a note in here about not inspecting the carpet. If the house was vacant and there was no furniture, I wouldn't put in here that we're not moving the refrigerator off of the wall or that we're not sliding the couch out of the way. Um, it's a visual inspection. So on a two-story property, I don't have a 30-foot ladder. It's not, it's not common practice in our industry to carry 30-foot ladders. I can, if I can identify something on a second story, I will, but I'm not liable for the, for the conditions on a two-story property that aren't visible. I wouldn't put in here any of that stuff, it was only a one-story property. It's important to read this, you know, if, if you guys look at this now, you look at this in 10 years, you look at this same webinar in 20 years, one common theme will, will be consistent throughout, and that is read the reports. There's no way that you guys can do the responsibilities that you have as a real estate agent without reading the reports. If there was ever any, uh, uh, concern that arose and, and it ever got taken to an elevated state, maybe a lawsuit or whatever, you could never stand in front of a judge and say, I did everything, I, I did my fiduciary responsibility, I did everything that I could to best represent my client. And the, 
and the judge says, well, didn't you read right there that they didn't inspect that? Well, no, I, that's boy, I didn't read that. It's not going to help you out. Read the reports. Read the entirety of the reports. If you guys don't take anything else from this inspection uh, training other than read your reports, I'll be happy because the information is all there. What I'm trying to do today is help you understand the information that's there, uh, and I'll be here. You know, you guys can always call and ask to talk to me, but the more you can read the reports, the more you'll understand the reports, and the better agents you'll become. And the better agents you become, the more business you do, which ultimately helps us. So our job here, the, the reason we're doing this today is to help educate uh, agents on how to read these reports. So this area is not inspected, please read, is important. Look at these areas, areas under the decks that are built too close to the ground. I'm not gonna rip the deck boards up to look at what's going on underneath there. I will call to have it further inspected. The homeowner can do it. Uh, we can go back out later and do that, but I can't do destructive work while I'm at the property during my original inspection. Uh, here are some guarantees. Most, most guarantees are very, very similar amongst companies. You guys can read some companies guarantee a fumigation for two years, some three. Um, here, here are the guarantees that HomeGuard has, but these are pretty consistent uh, amongst all of the other inspection companies. The repairs, the wood repairs that we're doing will guarantee for a year. Uh, if we do a fumigation, if we tent the house, I'll guarantee, it's more of a warranty at this point, but we'll guarantee that the property uh, doesn't get termites within the next three years. It's incredibly difficult to guarantee that. Really what this is is a warranty, and the difference there is a guarantee will say, I guarantee they won't come back in three years. I can't guarantee that though, because maybe I take the tarp off of your house today and dry wood termites from three streets over are swarming that day and they land on your property. If you guys notice those termites within three years, we'll come back out and we'll treat those termites again, no charge. Most companies uh, do that. It's not really a guarantee because I can't do anything to guarantee that to stop termites from infesting your home. It's part of the reason our, our business is, you know, I've been in my family and the home garden, we've been open 30 plus years. My family's been doing it for 60 years because termites are, are it's hard to guarantee, it's hard to prevent them from getting into your home. So what do we do to treat them? How do we handle them? We do give a guarantee though, if you do notice termites within three years, call us, we'll come back out and we'll treat those. If we're doing a local treatment or where we, we infest or we drill into the wood and we treat those termites, um, we give a guarantee of that for one year. There are certain things that aren't guaranteed, that won't be guaranteed by the inspection company. Uh, first one being, we don't guarantee work done by others. So I mentioned earlier that maybe you have a family member that's a contractor and they'll do the work that we identify in our report. We come back out, I don't, I might say that the damage has been removed, but I will not, nor ever will I guarantee their work. I don't, I, I wasn't there during the construction. We do the work. I know how my team does the work, so I'll guarantee my repairs, but I will never guarantee somebody else's repairs. Uh, so if you're looking for that, you have to go to the original company that did the repairs. I'll certify the property. I'll say that uh, work was done here, the damage is gone, uh, either it's been repaired or the owner is advised to continue with repairs. However, I'm not going to uh, guarantee the repairs. I also can't guarantee against future infestations or infections. If I fix a plumbing leak today and a year from now, there's another plumbing leak, it's likely a new condition. I'm not, I'm not gonna guarantee against that. If we treat for termites today and five years from now, termites land at your house and start doing termite damage again, I'm not gonna guarantee against a future infest, infestation as well. Uh, and then conditions might be present at the time, but not evident. Remember, termites are concealed. They're, they're hiding, they're, they live in the wood. It's rare that we see them, they don't like the light. When they're swarming is when we generally see the termite. Um, or they live in the ground. I'm not, unless they've made themselves evident, I'm not liable for the condition if it wasn't present. If it was present and I, I didn't identify that, then I am liable for that. And again, you've done the responsible thing as a real estate agent and offset that liability so that if there was something that I didn't identify and maybe the buyers move in and a month later they're doing some work and the contractor says, man, this is a lot of stuff going on here. Didn't you have inspections done? And they say, yes, I did. If that condition of damage was evident, I'm responsible for that. But if it wasn't evident, if it was concealed behind walls, I mean, if the contractor blowing a wall out and then he finds damage, the inspection companies, none of them, no termite inspection company, is going to guarantee against conditions that are there but not present. So condition has to be present. 
uh, and then we'll identify those conditions. So on the next page, you guys will notice, um, and these are in every single term I report, what a reinspection is actually uh, identified as, and then some conditions that apply to, to reinspections that are a little bit different than just a regular complete or limited inspection. We have to do a reinspection, and a reinspection again is if you had somebody else do the work, but you want us to certify the property. Maybe a lender is requiring, maybe you've turned these reports in, and the lender is requiring before they close off on this deal, they want all of the section one work, all of the active infestations and infections to be handled before they'll fund the loan. If you have somebody else do the work, I have to come back out there within four months to make sure that that work has been done. Right now in the current climate of, of real estate market where there's not a whole lot of inventory and, and houses move pretty quick and there's multiple offers, reinspections are being done uh, obviously within this four months, but sometimes a house will go on the market. Um, there are some conditions present. You have an inspection, we identify some, some things, and then the buyers maybe take the house, take the listing down. They're gonna wait a little while. Then they have the work done, but it's been longer than four months from that original inspection, and they call us and they say, hey, we had this work done, please come out and certify it. If it's longer than four months, we're required to do a new original inspection. We don't charge as much, but we still have to go back out and do a complete brand new inspection on the property because it's been longer than four months. And then <clears throat> if you guys are ordering a reinspection, we have to do that reinspection within 10 days. The state requires us to do that. And really what that is, is the state, you know, as a termite inspection company, I want you to choose us to do the repairs, but I'm not going to hold you hostage for using somebody else to do those repairs. I'm, and, and that would happen if, let's say you chose somebody else and this law wasn't in effect. I could say, yeah, I'll be out there, but I'll be out there in 30 days. Well, at that point, the transaction is going to fall through. So if you call to have a reinspection performed within 10 days of that, I must be out there to reinspect that. It's not ever been an issue. <clears throat> I don't ever anticipate it being an issue. Um, but with other companies, when you're talking to them, make sure that they'll be able to get you within those 10 days. Uh, again, the reinspection is a visual inspection. Uh, there are times where I'll call an area that's concealed, maybe a bathroom floor is a perfect example. I can tell that there's damage to that bathroom floor. Maybe it's linoleum, vinyl flooring. There's the vinyl flooring, there's a wood underlayment there, and then there's your subfloor. Maybe I'm underneath the home and I'm looking up and I see that there's damaged subfloor. I'm gonna call that, have that area uh, to, re to remove or replace that wood in that area. Contractor, maybe you have a family member, contractor, they go in, they not only take that damaged wood out, but they install everything new again. I never was able to see any of the concealed areas. I wasn't ever able to determine if any of the damage that I was able to see spread into areas that I wasn't able to see. So here it says, if uh, areas of, if concealed areas are desired to be inspected, let us know. Anytime that you're doing repairs from somebody else is doing the repairs, and there's a concealed area, bathroom floors particularly, call us to come back out and do the reinspection after the damage has been removed before things were replaced. So on that bathroom floor, have your contractor go in there, tear the whole bathroom apart, tear all the, the wood out, the damaged wood, and then have us come and take a look and say, yes, this whole area is free and clear of any active infestation or infection. Here is your reinspection certified. Otherwise, my certification will say, it appears as all, though all of the concealed damage has been removed. However, an open reinspection was never performed. Might not cause any problems, but it might. So if you do have an open area, have us come out when the area is open. That's a, that's a big question that we get from a lot of agents. And then any guarantee on any of the other work, again, we talked about this, but on a reinspection, all that I'm doing is looking at somebody else's work. And I will never, ever guarantee anybody else's work. I'll say that they've removed the damage, but I won't guarantee their work. So in the report, and this is what I was talking about, section one items, in the report, here's how it looks. You'll see, we group all of our section one items together. Other companies, again, break their, their reports into the different areas of the home, but either way, you guys can see, every, underneath every single item, our company, any other company, they will tell you, this is a section one item, this is a section two item, this is a further inspection item. In this case, we're looking at some section one items. 
We'll give you our findings from this image was noted to the barge rafter. The barge rafter is the last rafter that comes down on the edge of the home. And maybe I was looking right here and I noticed that there was, you guys can see that there's some moisture in these pictures. There was some water damage to the end of this barge rafter here. So I identified that damage. Fungus damage was noted to the barge rafter. I will also tell you that this piece of wood needs to be replaced. <clears throat> our company, we include pictures. So it'll say see picture one at the end of our report, there's a group of pictures there and you can see the, the uh, damaged barge rafter. And it's just a little extra help so that you guys can read these reports, look at them and then be able to identify uh, that there's some additional damage there. Fungus damage was noted to the roof sheathing. Here's some water damage, some roof sheathing here, the recommendation to repair it, and then some pictures for that. The pictures are representative of the damage that's there. If I'm walking down the side of a house where 25 rafters are damaged down the complete right side of the home, I would never take 25 pictures. I might take one or two pictures as a representative number of pictures for the damage. Uh, so just keep that in mind. The pictures are there to help, but it's not, they're not pictures of all of the damage that's on the property. But no matter what company you choose, they will tell you whether it's a section one item, they will give you a finding and they will give you a recommendation for repair. Got a couple yeah. questions, Jimmy. Yes. Uh, so the first has to do with billing. What happens when the transaction falls through? Who do you get the payment from if billed to escrow? So generally the ordering party is who we're gonna um, request payment from. Um, a lot of times agents are the ones that actually order the inspection. We will try to contact the agent to get the owner information or whoever the ordering party was, maybe the agent represented the buyer. We'll contact the agent to get that buyer's information so that we can go after those. There are times where um, agents don't give that information. We would never, you know, cause technically we can put a mechanics lien on the home. Uh, and so that we would have to get paid before a transaction could happen with the home. Um, but we understand that our business is business with, it's a, it's a business business relationship with agents. We're not going to go after agents um, for those billing, but generally we'll contact the agent and say, Hey, we noticed there was an inspection done 80 days ago. We still haven't received escrow. Oh, escrow fell through. You guys didn't sell the property. I mean, work was still performed on that property. And so in, in good faith, we would imagine that, you know, we would still need to be paid for our inspection and our time. Uh, so everyone's a case by case. We, I can tell you right now that we write off a lot of bad debt at the end of the year. Uh, that's not an open invitation for agents to say, well, ah, we're not going to pay you and we're not going to give any information. But, you know, uh, again, agents that do 30, 40, 50 transactions a year with us, I'm never going to say, hey, you owe us $240 from that, that roof inspection. So, um, but generally we'll, we'll, we'll contact whoever the, inf the ordering party was and we'll try to get the billing information that way. And the final question is, when should you order your inspection? That's a good question. So, so my recommendation for that is the second, as a, the second you sign a listing agreement with um, somebody ready to sell their home, order inspections. You want to know what the condition of the home is prior to having buyers come through. I understand that right now we're in a seller's market. Sellers have a little bit of power in that I can list my home. I don't have to do any inspection. I'm selling the home as is. I know it's a little confusing. Uh, I want to know what as is is before I sell it. So I would, I would order the inspections up front. Here's what you don't want to happen is to be caught off guard when a buyer comes through with inspections. I take great pride in ownership of my home, but I don't know everything that's going on underneath my home because I don't go underneath my home. I would hate to, to figure out, look at all the comps, figure out what I should list my home for. We'll take a baseline number of million dollars. I would hate to list my home for a million dollars because I think that's what it's worth and then have a buyer come through and find $50,000 worth of damage underneath the home that I didn't know about because now it's a problem. Maybe if I got the inspections up front, the second I signed that listing agreement, we order inspections as a, as a homeowner to have that information prior to setting a price or even to have the ability to fix those problems prior to a buyer coming through because then you don't want the buyers to have power. I understand right now if a buyer says, yes, there's all that damage, I want you to lower the price, I want you to do all the work, you might say, kick rocks, I got 15 people behind you that will buy it as is, I get that. Uh, but it's still nice to know what's going on with the condition of the home prior to, to selling the home. And then as a buyer, obviously you wanna have the inspections done, especially if the, the listing agent uh, didn't have any done. So my recommendation has always been 
even as we, we transition from buyers to sellers markets or we go through that, that path there to order the inspections up front. That way you're, you're doing that and you're not negotiating off of a, a fictitious number. You have a number of uh, repairs that you know is there. And then if a buyer comes through and they order their own inspections, now you've got two different sets of buys, two different people looking at the property. Uh, it's gonna make that transaction uh, a little bit that much smoother toward, toward the end there when things are needing to close and we're on tight schedules. So is that it actually? Yes, it was. Okay, so um, the authorization agreement, let's say you do have your inspection company do the repairs. Uh, they go out, they identify 10 things wrong with your house, items 1A through 1H, um, they're there. You can have that inspection company do the repair. And the authorization pages look very similar company to company, and this is what ours looks like. But basically, you will identify or work with our company to identify the repairs that you want done. You can do one repair, you can do all repairs, you can do a mixture of some you will write on here what items are to be performed or our company will fill that out for you. I'll put the total price in there and then initial, there's three pages to an authorization agreement. And it's gonna talk about different things, a right to cancel, um, condition permits, a lot of different stuff is gonna be disclosed in the authorization agreements that this is a contract. You guys are having work done on your property. You're, you're using us as a contractor to do those repairs. So we put together this authorization agreement. Uh, you sign an initial the pages at the bottom, Again, most termite companies will include this. If they're doing the repairs, they might give you a dollar amount to repair those items. There are some companies that don't do the repairs. They're not gonna put a dollar. They're just gonna refer you out to the other trades. Um, but we're, we're putting in uh, dollar amounts for the repairs. Uh, the, the work is what we're looking for. The authorization agreement, you could on this page also circle. We've seen a lot of different ways. You know, circle 1A, 1B, 1C, 1F, 1G. That might be the drywood termites, the drywood termite damage, the fumigation, the subterranean termites. About 70% of the homes in the valley here, we find drywood termites. About 35% of the homes, we find subterranean termites. Uh, about 80, 85% of the homes, we find fungus. So um, you guys can let us know here. You'll sign, uh, authorize the work to be done. HomeGuard will also allow you to um, build the repairs to escrow as well. So, you know, tight for money and you want to build the repairs to escrow so that it comes out of the funds, great. Uh, I can tell you though, we are a little bit more proactive in, in receiving the funds from escrow um, because now we're talking thousands of dollars versus hundreds of dollars on the inspection. But again, you would uh, sign this authorization agreement here and get it back to us. So we're wrapping up here. These are the different types of certifications that we're looking for. Um, when I go out to a property and I don't identify any um, infestations or infections. I, I must certify that property. But I'll tell you something about reading that certification. The certification reply, uh, applies to section one items only, not further inspection items. So if I go out to a property, and I'll give you guys a real life example of something that I actually did. If I go out to a property and I don't find any section one on the home, any active infestation or infection, I must certify that property. The Structural Pest Control Board makes me certify that on this inspection date, no active infestation or infection was noted to the visible and accessible areas. But there are a lot of inaccessible areas, that sub area, a, a garage full of storage. If, if I have those further inspection items on my report, but I don't have any other section one, I certify that property. Don't think that that's a full certification. You wanna have the further inspections done. It's my point, it's always been my point that further inspection items are just as important as section one, maybe even a little bit more important because at least with most of the section one, you know what you have, but with the further inspection, you have no idea. Real life example, I go out to a property, uh, meet the owner, the owner's agent, I meet the owner's agent, and I start my inspection and two Rottweiler dogs are um, in the backyard jumping on the fence. I'm not familiar with the dogs, the agent is not familiar with the dogs. That backyard is inaccessible. I say, okay, well, maybe we can do this kind of puzzle game where we go inside, we let the dogs into the garage, and then I can inspect the backyard. But I open up the garage and the garage was full of storage. So right away, first two items on my report is that the backyard is inaccessible for inspection and the garage is inaccessible for inspection due to storage. We will come back out and further inspect those items, but for now, I can't inspect those items. I go inside the property, um, Things look fine in the, in the kitchen, in the bath, uh, math, uh, hall bathroom, but I get to the master bathroom, master bedroom door, and it's locked. 
ask the agent if he has the key. He says, no, the, the owners were supposed to leave it here. Third item on my report essentially is that the master bedroom is inaccessible, which also had the sub area to go underneath the house and the attic to go up in, into the attic, the attic access. So I have a pretty clean looking report, not a whole lot going on throughout the house, except for I was never able to get in the backyard, I was never, never able to get into the garage, and I was never able to get into the sub area. I have to issue a certification on that report because in the accessible areas, I have no section one. Well, it turns out that this property, once we got into the backyard, had a, a, an attached patio cover on the back that actually had some negative slope where water was draining back onto the property, uh, onto the structure and causing wood damage to the wall in the back. Um, the master bedroom was open. We were able to get into the sub area. The master bathroom was shot, damaged underneath. The stall shower had been leaking for years. There ended up being about forty or fifty thousand dollars of damage on this property in the areas that were concealed, and I was never able to see. So even though the original report got a Section One certification, there were those further inspection items. Once I issued my supplemental report, that certification says, "Yeah, that was on the accessible areas. Here's what's on the accessible areas, and there's a lot of damage." So when you're reading your reports, don't just flip to the last page. And this is for the new agents in the room here. Don't just flip to the last page and look at the dollar amount of the section one and start working your negotiation there. I understand a lot of this, the reports are for negotiation right now. Don't just look at the section one. Look at the further inspection items and have those inspection items perform. If you're at the property at the time of the original inspection and the termite inspector is saying, hey, listen, we got some areas that we can't see here. We need to come back out and look at those areas. The next phone call that you guys should make is to your inspection company to see when you can get on the books to have that inspector come back out and look at that property because you don't wanna just have that certification and think that the house is clean and everything's great and then find out later when a further inspection is done that you have a lot of damage there. The other thing, yeah, yeah. Um, are there effective organic treatments for termites available? So, yeah, I mean, commonly when I hear effective organic, uh, I'm thinking that most people are talking about orange oil. Orange oil is a registered uh, chemical with the EPA. It has a warning label on it. Uh, it's not safe to consume. You can't drink it. Uh, but it is, it is um, a, a little bit safer in its application. Um, orange oil is effective if it can be applied to, um, to an area where I know the infestation is at. We have orange oil, we've used orange oil. It's not my favorite in my personal history. It's not my favorite. I've done some, some training um, at UC Berkeley on, on different applications. There's a, 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 probably the leading entomologist in the state, Dr. Bernard Lewis, has done some, some things. He built Termite City, term, uh, Villa Termite is what he calls it. And he built this structure at, on UC Berkeley's campus. And then they infested the, the wood and they used all sorts of different types of treatments. The chemical treatment that we're using is probably the best. Fumigation by far and away is, is the number one way to, to treat termites. But um, there are a little bit more, um, you know, it's, it's not an alternative. Orange oil is not an alternative to fumigation. So even the companies that specialize in orange oil, um, and they're great companies. We, a lot of our inspectors have inspected there and, and vice versa. There, if an inspector goes out though and they find termites in multiple different locations, the state still requires that they call a fumigation. And so even though they specialize in orange oil, they're still calling to have a fumigation done. Um, but orange oil is, is a chemical, um, it's registered with the EPA, uh, but it is something that HomeGuard has, and there are a lot of companies that specialize in it. it smells wonderful, you can be at the property while the treatments are being performed. Uh, you don't have to vacate the property at all, um, but they have to be applied in the right uh, scenario, so to speak. Okay, and there's one more question. Sure. Can we rely on just skimming reading through the summary page? Um, I, because this is a webinar and broadcast and save, no. Read, read the entirety of the report. Read through, this. I, I imagine the summary page being those areas not inspected. I'm, I'm thinking that's what that is in reference to. Um, if you're gonna do that, just know know the condition, get yourself more familiar. As you become a seasoned agent, uh, and these are for the newer agents in the room here, as you become a seasoned agent, you're gonna know that termite inspection companies don't identify certain conditions um, or, or look at certain areas. Um, but 
I would read through every single item that's on the report because you, you want to know what needs to be done. You're going to tell your clients they need to read through the report, but they're going to have questions. And so the more that you're familiar with the items in that particular report, uh, the better able that you're going to be to serve your client. Um, so I wouldn't ever skim on these reports. These are million dollar transactions, million and a half, two, five, seven million dollar transactions. Um, although it's a low relative cost for inspections, it's a high importance. These are, you know, there's only a few inspections being done on a property. They sh the report should be read throughout. Ashley? Oh, all right, we already go. There's a third type of certification that we can give. Um, it's with the exception of an item. A lot of times we give this on a condo unit. Um, I might go to a condo and it's attached to eight different units and I jump up into the attic and I find drywood termites in the attic and I, they're swarmers and I can't pinpoint what the location is. I can't do a local treatment. I have to call to fumigate that structure. The problem is you can't limit the fumigation on an attached building. I can't, you know, if it's unit four in the middle of eight or nine units, I can't just fumigate that one unit. I have to call to fumigate the entire structure, which will never happen. No, you know, you are not going to get, we can barely get one person to agree to a fumigation in a transaction right now, let alone eight people on all. So if your lender is requiring a certification um, and you have a fumigation on, let's say a condo, we will issue the certification that says we certify that all the damage and infestations were removed out of, um, out of this structure, except for this one item. And that one item might be the fumigation. And we might offer you a secondary substandard, like I, I find termites in four locations, I'm gonna to call to have that house fumigated, but maybe a fumigation isn't possible for whatever reason. I can offer you a secondary treatment method to locally treat it, but it's a substandard method. I would never guarantee that because it's my opinion as the inspector that that local treatment won't work. You need to have the fumigation done. Um, so I would call to have that house fumigated, but as a secondary substandard, I would call to have the house locally treated. So my certification would say that all of the infestations and infections were taken care of, except for that fumigation. We did do the local treatment, but we're not certifying the local treatment and we're not certifying the fumigation because we never did it. So those are the different types of certifications. Generally, uh, certification one is when I'm out at the property and I don't find any damage. Certification two is when all of the work has been done by somebody else. I return to the property. Um, I say that all the damage has been removed. I issue a certification to most often it's certification to uh, it's where I go out. Somebody else has done the repairs. I come back out. I said, yeah, I called water damage to the girder contractor fixed that I called water damage to a rafter subcontractor fixed that I called drywood termites to the patio cover contractor just ripped the patio cover down. Great. That took care of the infestation because they only live in the wood. No chemical treatment needs to be done. Um, so that would then be issued in that type of certification where we're, we're basically certifying anybody else's work and then our own work. So if you choose HomeGuard to do the repairs, as soon as we're done doing all of the repairs, we issue that certification in a, what we call an NOC or a notice of work completed. Um, so we got yeah, yeah, great. Uh, what are our liabilities since we are not the expert? Your liability as an agent. Um, is to do your agent visual inspection disclosure where you walk through the property and identify whatever it is that you can identify. Um, I would talk to the broker in your office as to what your particular liabilities are. What we know though is not ordering inspections opens you up to liability later. We don't know what the extent of that liability is and liability is kind of a funny thing in that um, it's not always zero or 100%. You might be able to apply 20% liability to an agent 40% liability to an inspection company and another 40% inspection, 40% uh, to another inspection company. We don't know exactly what the liability is, but by not ordering inspections, you're opening yourself up because if they're, you know, to, to, to best represent your client and to not order inspections, they don't go hand in hand. If you're best representing your clients, you're letting your clients know, hey, at least recommend to have inspections done. If they decide, I don't want to have inspections done, then it's on them and they, you know, if there's any sort of um, harm done later, it's on the person that said that they don't want it. But as the agent, you should always recommend to have the inspections done. Turn my home, roof, if there's a pool, have a pool inspection done. If there's a chimney, have a chimney inspection done. Those are the types of things that 
the more liability that you can offset, the more that you can push off onto somebody who is a professional, who is licensed as a termite inspector, others get certified. So you might have a certified home inspector. The more that you can put that liability onto somebody else, the less it's going to affect you in the long run moving forward. Does fumigation cover the attached deck on the ground level? If it's included in the fumigation. So if it's attached, generally we're, we're going to include that in the fumigation tarp. So we'll take the tarp and we wrap it around the front, we take down the sides of the house, and if there's a deck or patio cover, even if it's detached, if it's close enough to the structure, we just include that in the fumigation tarp. Um, there are times where people don't want, at my home in particular, I have a, a pergola, a patio cover at the back of my house that I have some bougainvillea growing up on and house up on. Fumigation, again, why fumigation isn't always the best is the fumigation is going to kill my plants. It's going to kill anything. Fumigation is very uh, lethal. It will kill anything living, pets, plants, in-laws. So if, if you have living things in your home or attached to your home and you have fumigation done, it's going to kill those things. Um, so what we recommend like on the front of a home, if you have plants or hedges that you want to keep, that you, you allow us 12 inches that we can at least get our tarp down the front of the house and then we put our sandbags at the bottom. If you have a patio cover on the back and there's nothing on it, include that patio cover, include that deck in the fumigation. If How long do residents have to be out of the home for a fumigation? Three days. Generally uh, up on a Monday, comes down on a Wednesday. So they'd be out of the house Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for a fumigation. For a local treatment, it's just a few hours while we're doing the treatment. So again, Local treatment you can have done in a couple hours while you're at work one day, if, for those of us who get to go back to work. Um, if, you're, if you're doing a fumigation though, you have to go somewhere for three days. So uh, if you have to stay in a hotel, you have to worry about those costs. So it's not just the cost of the fumigation. A, a fumigation generally runs about three times the cost of a local treatment, roughly. I mean, maybe double the a local treatment, certainly more than a local treatment. So. It's not just the cost of the fumigation, it's also the cost of what you're gonna do for those three days when you're, at, when you're out of fumigation. So to clarify, you're saying that dry rot is caused by water damage, not fungus? Uh, for everybody in this room, just think that fungus and dry rot are the same thing. So fungus and dry rot is caused by water. So excessive moisture conditions will lead to fungus or dry rot. Basically, water will destroy the wood. The wood becomes soft, um, it falls apart. And so when, I, when, when you have excessive moisture conditions on a piece of wood, that water gets wet. I mean, obviously the water is wet. Although there, I don't know if anybody's been hearing about is water wet, but um, that piece of wood will get wet and then fungus will start to grow. And it grows as a surface fungus to start. Uh, and then it starts to develop. And sometimes you'll see these like mushroom growths on a piece of wood. Eventually that wood will become compromised. The structural integrity of that wood becomes compromised. We call it fungus, others call it dry rot. It's essentially the same thing. Both of them are caused by excessive moisture conditions. All right, we are ready. So, so that's, that's it guys, we, we appreciate the time. We have our socials there. You guys can take a look at our uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Indeed, and Pinterest. Um, One more yeah. yeah. <laughs> do clothes need to be removed from the home and does furniture need to be covered? What about food in the fridge or freezer? Good question. So clothing, bedding, dishes, none of that stuff has to be removed from the home. I know people do. And here's the first thing that people do after a fumigation has been done is they take all their dishes out and they throw them in the dishwasher, they strip their bedding, they throw it in the, the washing machine. But it's a chemical gas, kind of like the air that I breathe. <sighs> nothing sticks to my hand. There's nothing from the gas that is going to stick to anything the gas can work its way in.